Good morning, everybody. Is my mic work? I can hear a booming voice. Is my mic working? Yes, very good. Um, well, welcome back to, uh, to Lent term. My name's David Tong, uh, and this is Vector Calculus. Um, let me try to give you a sense of what, what this course is about. Uh, in a nutshell, what we're going to do over the next 24 lectures is uh, take uh, the ideas of calculus that you all know and love already and just generalize them to um, uh, a slightly wider class of functions. In particular, uh, a class of functions that act on higher dimensional spaces. So um, let me uh, just try and clarify what, what I mean by that. Um, here's what you know and love about, uh, about calculus, or at least know about calculus. Um, if you take a function, let's say y equals f of x, uh, where y and x are both real numbers. So, so what does that mean? It means you give me a number x, I plug it into my function, and I hand you back another number y. So given uh, such a class of functions, uh, there's a couple of very important things that you can do, at least if the functions have nice properties, if they're smooth and continuous and, and so forth. So, so what can you do? Um, you can differentiate them, uh, and you can integrate them. And both of those operations result in a, in a new function, f prime or, or the integral of x, which again is a function that takes a real number to, to a real number. Um, moreover, both of these operations have a very nice geometrical meaning. Uh, so, so what do I mean by that? Uh, you plot a graph. This is the y-axis. This is the x-axis. Uh, the function f is some wiggly line. Uh, differentiating the function tells you the gradient at any point, And integrating the function tells you the area under the graph. And uh, finally, th there's a magical relationship, which you've known for so long. You're probably a bit blasé about it. But there's a magical relationship between differentiation and integration, which is that they're the inverses of each other. It's something that's enshrined in the fundamental theorem of calculus. So there's a collection of ideas around differentiation and integration. And our goal over the next uh, 24 lectures is simply to take that circle of ideas uh, and apply it to a larger class of functions. Uh, the larger class of functions is still going to be of the form y equals f of x. The novelty is that both y and x are now going to be vectors rather than real numbers. Uh, they may be vectors of the same dimension for some examples. In other examples, they'll be vectors of different dimensions. Uh, we'll even see examples where one is a vector and the other is just a real number. It's a vector of dimension one, obviously. Um, but in all these cases, what we want to learn to do um, is how you can differentiate these functions, um, how you can integrate these functions, uh, what the geometrical interpretation of that integration and, and uh, differentiation is, um, and also how differentiation and integration are related to each other. What's the analog of the fundamental theorem of, uh, of, of calculus? Um, and, and we'll see, it, it's, sort of, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It, it's not the same story for every, different, uh, for, for every class of functions. The story differs a little bit depending on the dimensions uh, of these vectors, x and y. Um, sometimes it's obvious, uh, sometimes it's much less obvious exactly how uh, one should go about differentiating and, and integrating. It's the less obvious ones that are more interesting, uh, obviously. All right, so that, that's where we're going over the next, um, uh, the, the, the next few weeks. I, I should also tell you why we're doing this, um, I, and there are very good reasons to, to, to do this. The, the first is obvious. It, it's just that um, calculus is a big deal. It's, you know, it's hard to think of another development in mathematics that had as much impact as, uh, uh, as the development of calculus. Um, so you should just obviously try and apply it any way you can. Whenever there's a, a new class of objects, you should think about how you can differentiate uh, and how you, you integrate. Um, but the payoff is, is worth it. Uh, it turns out that the tools we'll develop in, in this course um, are tools uh, that are very important for the development of other areas of mathematics, PDE theory, um, geometry in particular, a large swathe of geometry requires these tools. Um, on the way here, I was trying to think of laws of physics that do not require the language we'll develop in this course. I don't think there are any. I think literally every law of physics 
um, needs or is written in, in the language that we'll develop or some generalization of it. Um, engineers need to learn this stuff to do whatever engineers do. I don't even know. Um, I, I, I was chatting to a computer scientist friend yesterday. He said the computer scientists need to learn this for machine learning. So it, it really just is one of the tools um, that is needed throughout the quantitative sciences. It's just basic maths that um, uh, will enhance your lives, basically. All right. Um, that's where we're going. Before we, we, we start, let me point out um, uh, a few different resources. Uh, one that I hope is useful, I wrote a bunch of, of lecture notes. Uh, they're online. Um, I'm not going to hand them out, uh, but if you just Google David Tong Vector Calculus, you, you, you can find them. Actually, I, I checked this morning. If you just Google lecture notes on Vector Calculus, they, they come up first. Um, so, at, le at least for me, but maybe Google personalized it a little bit. Um, uh, I should say that there's a few cases I got a little bit carried away. So there's a few places where if there was something cute to say, I, I, I said it, um, which means that there's a, uh, a number of places where there's some extra non-examinable material um, in the lecture notes. Uh, and I'm unlikely to cover that in, in class. I, I'd love to, I think I just don't have time. Um, uh, all of which means that, um, as always, the schedules is the stuff that's examinable. And I think I'm unlikely to deviate too much from the schedules um, in these classes. But if I do, if I cover non-examinable stuff, I'll tell you in, in the lectures. It doesn't say in the, um, in the lecture notes what's examinable and what's not. Um, if you don't like the way I explain things, the good news is there are loads of books on this subject. This is a course which is taught in every single university on the planet, maths, physics, engineering, computer science departments. And they all do it more or less the same, maybe with a little bit more rigor. Um, in mathematics departments, so dozens of books out there, maybe probably hundreds of books. Um, they're either called vector calculus, or sometimes they're called multivariable calculus. And sometimes there's a really old-fashioned name, which is multivariate calculus. I don't know why people, people use that. But, but one of those three names is, is going to be the title of almost every book. Um, so here's a couple that I like. Uh, I, I've listed these in the front page of the lecture notes as well, so you don't need to remember what I'm, uh, what I'm saying. This one is by Marsden and Tromba. Um, it looks super thick, but it's just because they hold you very gently by the hand and walk you through the subject with dozens and dozens of examples, much many more examples um, than I'm going to do here. So it, it's just a very nice, gentle book. If you're struggling with the basics, um, this, I think, is a really uh, good place to turn. Um, this one is, is not too dissimilar. It, it's, it's much thinner, as you can see. Um, but again, it just, it's very gentle, uh, very basic. It's by Shea. It's called Divgrad Curl and all that. Divgrad and Curl are three things you can do with an upside-down triangle, which we'll, we'll learn as, uh, um, as the course progresses. It, it's a little bit odd um, uh, for the following reasons. It, it has a, a novel way of approaching the, the subject. Um, there are a set of four equations called the Maxwell equations, um, which over the next few years you, you will um, very much uh, grow familiar with. Uh, and they're the set of equations that describe electricity and magnetism. And they're all written in the language of vector calculus that, that we're going to develop. So Shea um, uses the Maxwell equations as a vehicle to teach vector calculus itself. Um, which we'll do a little bit in, the, in this course as well. So whenever there's some novel idea in vector calculus, he illustrates it by the Maxwell equations, which, which means that you learn vector calculus and a bit of electromagnetism at, at the same time, kind of um, hand in hand. So I, th I think it, he does a, a good job of this. Um, I think that's, that's all I have to say. Oh, I've got another 24 hours of stuff to say, but, but for now I think that's all I have to say. Oh, one more thing. Um, examples sheets are all uploaded already, so feel free to attack them whenever you like. If I remember at the end of a lecture, I'll, I'll sort of tell you which questions you can now um, attempt given the material that, that we've covered. All right. Any questions? Nothing. All right, let, let's, let's get going with, um, with some maths. So... It's my first time lecturing here. If you guys can't see at the back, just shout and I'll make my, my, my writing um, bigger. So, so what's the point of the course? Um, we will learn to differentiate uh, 
and integrate functions. And I'll, I'll use the word functions and maps interchangeably uh, throughout this course. Uh, of the form uh, f takes uh, an element of Rm to an element of uh, a different space Rn, or a potentially different space Rn, where m and n are obviously both positive integers, which just follows from the fact that they're in the exponent of, a, of an R. Um, so some language which I'm hoping you've heard before, but, it, but, it, but if you haven't, if you have a map, the thing it, it um, acts on is called the domain. It's this language you've seen before. Um, and, and mathematicians have a disease. When, when, whenever there's two things, and only two things, they name one, and then they can't be bothered to name the other. They just add the word co in front of it. So this is called uh, the co-domain. Is this also a word you've, you've heard before? Yes. Okay, very good. And um, an element... of Rm or Rn is a vector. So this subject so that's where the the course gets its name from just because the, um, the spaces on which these functions act are vector spaces. And as I said, multivariable calculus is a, another name for, for this subject. All right. Um, let me um, just kick off by, by giving you some examples of the sort of maps that we might see. And, um, you know, there's sort of two different things we'll do in parallel through this course. Uh, partly there's just the abstract mathematics, almost mathematics for, for its own sake. But then on the other hand, there's the fact that this mathematics is, is genuinely useful to, to describe things. And so there's the link between the maths and the physics that we'll also touch upon as, uh, as we go through. So in these examples of maps, um, from a physicist's perspective, there's roughly two different kinds of, uh, of maps Sort of three, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the two. Um, the, the two different kinds of maps are um, whether you think of the domain, Rm, as physical space, or whether you think of the codomain, Rn, as physical space. And there's utility to um, having both of those interpretations in mind. The, the third, of course, is where you think of neither of them as physical space, and the map is between two more abstract uh, objects. But for a lot of what we do, it'll be useful to either think of the domain or the codomain as, as the physical three-dimensional space um, in which we live. So um, to begin with, the first class uh, is going to be where the codomain is physical space. So a function f which maps uh, um, the real line r to rn. Uh, defines a curve in the space Rn. So that's from a somewhat abstract mathematical perspective. And in physics, uh, we might think quite naturally of R as time And, uh, as I said, the codomain Rn uh, as physical space. And we might write this as uh, the function f takes um, time t
to some point in Rn, and that point in Rn changes as, as time changes. In other words, maps of or functions of this kind uh, describe, describe trajectories of particles moving in time in some space Rn. And uh, j just an obvious point. If we're really talking about physics, it, it's sensible to put n equals to 3, or, or maybe 2 if the thing is, um, uh, is, is moving on a plane. All right, so, so um, maps of this kind is exactly what you're going to be dealing with in the dynamics and, and relativity uh, lectures, and, and there'll be some overlap. The kind of differentiation that you, you'll do there we'll also uh, see in this course. All right, but we can generalize maps of this kind. So generalizing... Um, map which takes R2 to, sorry, I made a mistake there. That should be uh, general Rn. Um, defines a surface. So you have a two-dimensional space, and this map embeds that two-dimensional space in what is generally a higher-dimensional space, Rn, and in doing so defines some uh, surface, two-dimensional surface within Rn. Similarly, maps from R3 to Rn define three-dimensional uh, subspaces of Rn, and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, but the curves in the surfaces will, uh, uh, for slightly obvious reasons, be the ones we focus on, because Rn will typically be R3, uh, the space in which we live. All right. Any questions about this? And how's the writing at the back? Can you, you haven't complained. Can you see? Okay, fantastic. Good. Any questions? All right. Um, what's the second class of maps? The second class of maps, um, at least from a physics perspective, uh, is, as I said, where you think of the domain as physical space rather than the co-domain uh, as physical, physical space. And uh, let me give you um, uh, an example. So in other... applications, the domain... RM... might be viewed as physical space. And so, for example, in physics, a scalar field is a map That's really awful, isn't it? Can you, is this overlit? Can you only barely see it? How do I, ah. Oops, it's the wrong one. <laughs> All right. Is that, is that better? Better, what better? Okay, great. All right, so um, uh, what physicists mean by a scalar field is some object, uh, typically an object which, which changes in time, although the time evolution is not something we're, we'll focus on in these lectures, but some object where you can assign a value to every single point uh, in space. Mathematicians just call it a map from uh, R3 to R, but physicists call it a scalar field. Uh, to give you two examples, um, approximately speaking, you can assign a temperature to every single point in this room. 
approximately, because if you go down to the atomic level, that doesn't make sense, but at least on some coarse-grained level, there is a temperature at every point in this room. That's a number um, that you can assign to every single point in space and defines a scalar field. So EG, temperature... T of X is a scalar field. Um, much more interesting scalar field that really does, as far as we know, hold at every single point in space is, is what's called the Higgs field. Uh, the, um, there is spread everywhere in the universe a fundamental field uh, of physics called the Higgs field. Um, it, it's a little bit boring in this room. In this room, it takes a value which is exactly 246 times 10 to the 9 electron volts everywhere in this room. If you want the Higgs field to deviate from that particular value, you have to build an LHC or something like an LHC, but that's exactly what happens in the LHC, is the value of the Higgs field deviates slightly from 246 GeV, uh, and in doing so, you create a particle that's called the Higgs boson. Um, so these are sort of concepts that are important um, in you know, basic everyday world like temperature, but also important in very fundamental ideas in, uh, in theoretical physics. So as is the Higgs field in fundamental physics. All right, a, a, a different um, class of fields that falls into this, um, this same category where the, the domain is physical space uh, is a vector field. So a vector field is a map from R3 to R3, where uh, the first R3 is physical space, and the second R3 uh, is something more abstract. And so, again, two, two very familiar examples that, that you'll all know. It is a true statement, um, uh, even at our best understanding of fundamental physics, that at every single point in the universe, there are two three-dimensional vectors. One of those three-dimensional vectors uh, is called the electric field. The other one is called the magnetic field. Um, they vary, uh, or their directions and magnitude vary in space. Their directions and magnitudes also vary in time, uh, but they're very good examples of a vector field. So e.g., the electric field E of X and magnetic field B of X are examples of vector fields. All right, so um, the way this is going to work is for the next couple of weeks, we'll be thinking about examples of the first kind. Uh, in fact, we'll, we'll start by thinking about curves um, as, as functions in some higher dimensional space. Then we'll think about surfaces as functions in some higher dimensional space. And having got those nailed down, we'll then jump to examples of the second kind and start thinking about fields and, um, and how they vary and how we differentiate them. So that's what we have in store. All right, so let me start with um, section one. And I think this is going to take us four lectures, maybe five lectures. It'll be some time just, um, just thinking about these particular um, uh, maps. So we will consider... Maps of the form uh, 
as I said previously, functions that take the real line into, into Rn. And uh, we're going to do the following. We're going to assign a coordinate. T. Uh, to the real line. Uh, as I said previously, if, if this is in the context of physics, it's useful to think of that T as time. Uh, but more generally, we can just think of it as an abstract coordinate labeling uh, the real line. And um, we'll use Cartesian coordinates... Uh, on Rn. So I'll take a point in Rn and I'll label it in the obvious way by n numbers x1 through to x, xn. And I'm also going to write this as xi ei, where this ei is an orthonormal basis. All right, so a couple of points. Um, I'm using summation convention here, so there's no explicit sum from i equals 1 to n. I've just repeated the i index, so the sum is uh, implicit. I'm going to be using summation convention throughout the course with, without comment. So whenever you see two indices repeated, assume they're summed, unless I tell you otherwise. Um, and then I've introduced this basis, uh, EI. It's the obvious basis. It's the basis where there's a 1 in the ith entry and everything else is, is 0. Okay, so that makes that equation at the top there work. And then this basis is, is such that it's orthonormal, meaning if I dot two of them together, I get zero or one, depending if they're the same or different. Okay. All right. Um, and let me just make a, a comment. Um, R3 is obviously going to be something of particular interest because we live in three-dimensional space. Um, and so we also use the notation... that this that these basis vectors uh, uh, where am I okay right, I'm going to call x hat y hat and z hat you, you'll also see the notation i j and k in, in bold or underlined I'm not going to use that notation but but if you read books it's uh, it's very common All right, so the image of the function f is called a parameterized curve. So you look at this map, it traces out a path in the um, codomain Rn, that, cur that path is a curve, um, but it's a parameterized curve precisely because there's a parameter t that labels the different points along it. And uh, in what follows, we'll call this abstract curve just capital C. All right, so let, let's look at some examples of, um, uh, of these curves. So uh, let me give you two examples. So we'll start with a map from R, which you can think of as time, to R3, which you can think of as uh, this room, if you like. 
um, given by x of t is a of t, v of t squared, 0. So that's the parameterized curve. Um, traces out a path in, in R3. Uh, but we can also say that the, the curve itself uh, is something very familiar. It's just a parabola. And uh, it's a parabola lying in the z equals zero plane, obviously, because the, the, the z component of this, this map just vanishes. Okay, to, to see that it's the parabola, you just take the components, the x and y component of, uh, of, of this map. Uh, if you look at y and multiply it by a squared, it's the same as x multiplied, uh, sorry, x squared multiplied by, by b. Okay, very quick calculation gives you that parabola. Um, so if I was to plot it, this is x, this is y, and it's just the usual kind of parabola. This is z coming out of the board. Um, a, a point that we're going to elaborate on as, as, as these examples proceed, uh, when you plot the curve in R3, in the codomain, you lose all track of this parameter t. That, that there's no sense once you've plotted the curve that you know where t equals 0 is or where t equals 100 is. It doesn't, it's not contained in the image itself. You have to go back to, to the original map. So note um, when... Plotting the curve, we lose information about the parameter t. All right, let me give you a, a second example that will just illustrate more or less the same points. Um, consider uh, the map x of t is cos t uh, sine t t. So what, what does this look like? If there wasn't the t in the z component, uh, this would just be a circle. As, as t increased, cos and sine just gives you a circle on the xy plane. But because there is that t, as t increases, you, you move in the z direction. So it, it's a helix where you're going in the xy plane, but at the same time you're increasing in the z direction as t increases. And... Um, I practiced this morning. I'm rubbish at drawing helixes, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, that's not very good, is it? Uh, so now the slower I go, the worse I am. Okay, so that, that's the z direction. Um, that's the x direction, and that's the y direction. And, you know, there's a nicer plot because Mathematica did it in the printed notes. Um, but, but hopefully you can do better. It should be obvious what it is. It's just a, a spiral increasing in the z direction. So the curve C is a helix. All right, let, let me go back to the, this point I, I, I made here about the fact that when you plot the curve C, um, you lose the information about the parameter. Uh, um, a consequence of that is um, you could have lots of different parameterizations of the path. 
In other words, lots of different maps, but all of those maps give exactly the same curve C when, when you plot them. So the choice of parameterization uh, is not unique. And in fact, there's an infinite number of ways to parameterize a curve. Choice is up to you. So here's an example. If I consider the, uh, the following map, cos lambda t, sine lambda t, lambda t. Then this gives the same helix. for all choices of, of lambda uh, being a real number. And in fact, it's, it's not just a lambda of t that I put there. If I put cos of any function of t, as long as I repeated the same function of t in the argument of sine and in the, in the z component, uh, that again would give me exactly the same helix when when I plotted it. The only difference is that different values of t now correspond to different points along that, that helix. All right, so, so now there's a question we can ask. Um, do we care about the parameterization of the curve, or, or do we care only about the curve itself? And um, it, it's not a yes or no Question. Actually, it's not a yes or no question, but, but it's not a question that has a definitive answer. It depends on the kind of thing that, that we're interested in. So there'll be uh, some problems that we're interested in where the parameterization matters, and there'll be other problems where, regardless of the parameterization we choose, uh, you get exactly the same answer. In particular, problems that are to do with the curve itself rather than the way we choose to, to parameterize the curve, obviously. So... Um, We'll deal with both in, in this course, but it turns out the latter are somehow the deeper questions uh, to ask. The, the questions where the choice of parameterization is irrelevant uh, are somehow the ones that are most natural to ask from a, a mathematics perspective and indeed from a theoretical physics perspective. So they'll, they'll typically be the ones that, that we focus on. So sometimes the choice of parameterization matters. Parameterization matters. So, for example, if, if t is time and x of t is position of some particle, uh, then the velocity of that particle uh, is proportional to, to lambda in this example of, uh, of the helix. So if, if this is some roller coaster that, that you're on that's doing some, some corkscrew, you really care about lambda. You really want to know if lambda is big or, or lambda is small or if lambda is negative and you're going to go backwards. Parameterization is crucial to you in that, uh, that particular context. But we will see that some questions are independent of the choice of parameterization. And as I mentioned, it's those questions that we'll, we'll typically home in on uh, as we go along because they tend to be the deepest and, and most interesting. All right, any questions? Yes? 
Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right, of course. La lambda couldn't be zero. And in fact, we'll see other examples of this. Yeah, I was wrong when I said lambda could be any, any real number. I should um, accept lambda equals zero. Uh, and we'll see other examples of this where um, your choice of parameterization can be bad in some way, um, and, and things go wrong if you pick a bad parameterization, and lambda equals zero is clearly a, a bad parameterization. Thanks. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's a, similar, um, a similar issue. It might be that, that that function, I think I give an example in the notes, square root of 1 minus t squared is only good when t is between minus 1 and plus 1. Otherwise, it becomes, becomes imaginary. And so if you replace it with a function like this, you don't get the whole helix. You just get, get, get some part of it. So, so yeah, there are caveats like this that you have to be aware of. They won't be super important for... Um, in practice, um, but yes, you should be aware of things like this. Other comments? Yeah. I didn't understand. If I do. I think you're, I, I've not, I've only got one vector, so I can't dot it with any, cross it with anything. Also, oh, you mean the direction of travel changes? Yeah. That, that's true, of course, but it's still the same curve. You, you, I think you should ask me afterwards, but, but if I change lambda, it's still the same C. It doesn't, it, it doesn't change. That, that's, that's important. All right. Um, so let's think about some things that we can do with this. Differentiating the curve. All right, so um, it, it's obvious how you differentiate these, uh, these functions. You've got a function of t uh, as written, I think it's disappeared, but as written as a vector, it's x1 of t, x2 of t, x, x to xn of t. Just differentiate each of the coordinates uh, independently. Um, I, I'm going to give a slightly novel definition of the derivative, though it, it, it's probably something you've seen before, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's a definition that, that will be useful um, in a slightly different context later. So that's why I'm giving it here. Um, a vector function x of t is differentiable at t if In the limit delta t goes to zero, we have x of t plus delta t minus x of t is equal to some function times delta t plus something of order delta t squared where the order is a big O, not a little O, as I will uh, stress shortly. And the point of this definition is that this function here, which, which obviously um, uh, is shouting out that it's the derivative because I put a dot above it, but this, this function is, uh, is defined by this equation. So this should be thought of as defining uh, and I'm sorry, I've lost some vectors. So the function x dot, which is the derivative, should be thought of as defined by this equation here. So in the limit that delta t goes to zero, if such a function exists at a point t, uh, that's the definition of the, uh, uh, of the derivative. And if x dot 
of T exists everywhere. The curve is said to be smooth. Oh, I, I see. Um, yeah, you don't usually write the big O as a vector. Strictly speaking, it, it, it should be. So um, th there are, you should think of this as n, um, uh, n different equations. And for each of those n equations, the correction is of order delta t squared. So strictly speaking, it should be a vector, but it's not usually done to, to write it as a vector. Yeah. So note, uh, this is the big O Notation, order delta t squared, and it means terms proportional to delta t squared or smaller. Have you been introduced to big O and little o and the difference between them? But my impression is pure mathematicians use little o and applied mathematicians, physicists use big O. I don't know if that's, that's, that's the norm, but that's, we're going to be using big O notation in this, um, this lecture. But by the way, according to Wikipedia, it, it used to be called big omicron and little omicron. Um, <laughs> until people realized that the Greek letter Omicron looks exactly the same as O, so it was just a bit pretentious calling it Omicron. So now big Omicron and little Omicron mean something a little different. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, again, a, a sort of sociological thing as much as, as anything. Um, in physics, uh, the dot uh, is usually used for time derivatives. So, for example, um, x dot of t you would use for the velocity of a, a particle moving in space. The, the dot is actually the notation that Newton himself introduced okay, some time ago. Um, and the prime... Uh, is usually used for spatial derivatives. So if you've got some function that varies in space, f of x, then in physics you would typically write f prime of x rather than, 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 than uh, f dot of x. Uh, but in mathematics, uh, mathematicians just use these interchangeably, as far as I can tell. Uh, and finally, so, some notation, all of which should be very familiar. Um, we're going to write uh, delta uh, delta x of t to be the difference in the positions at time t plus delta t and time t. And the derivative is then x dot, which is the same thing as dx by dt, is the limit as delta t goes to 0 of dx by dt. Okay. 